last time we got together with Sue, we were talking about um, someone who could help us talk about how we could roll out our new major, because we were working on our major. And she said, I know this person named Barry May, and he'd be great for you to bring on campus to work on this project. So we, as Suzanne Bordelon emailed him, and he was just delightful and said he'd love to come. And we met him at uh, Four Seas in March and had a wonderful breakfast. And the rest is uh, history as we worked toward this next landmark lecture, which is about really planning for our major, which will begin in fall 2014. Uh, Professor Maid um, has a his history that's common to ours in many ways, because at the University of Arkansas Little Rock, uh, in the early 90s, as this department was being born, with its labor pains, so was his department of rhetoric and writing uh, being born for many of the same reasons mm. and the same ways. And so he was involved as, I think, the first chair there, and uh, really yeah. went through a very similar experience that we went through in the early 90s here, before moving on to uh, Arizona State University, where he's been working uh, with a technical writing program for a number of years there. Um, but he's been very involved in developing majors and assessing majors and in, in uh, independent writing programs, program administration and technical writing and has so many of the same experiences and expertises that make him a really useful speaker for us here today. So he gave a, a really nice workshop for faculty this, this afternoon earlier where he talked about rolling out a major, sustaining a major, developing student body, um, working with alumni, all the kinds of things you need to be thinking about now and he's going to have a somewhat more general talk today for uh, this wonderful audience. So please welcome Dr. Barry May. Thank you, Glenn. And thank all of you at San Diego State for inviting me, and thanks to Sue for suggesting me. Uh, I've had a wonderful time with the faculty here so far, and I am I'm thrilled to reconnect with the Department of Rhetoric and Writing Studies at San Diego State. Uh, in fact, part of what I'm going to begin to talk about shows that I was in contact with all of you even though you weren't here at the beginning. Uh, and it, what's kind of interesting about this talk is I don't usually give scripted talks. I usually just have PowerPoint slides and kind of make it up as I go because I don't like to listen to scripted talks. And then one of the interesting things happened as I was putting this together, I started writing. And that's something you folks probably relate to. In fact, you see as a good thing. If someone can give you a prompt that elicits writing, someone's done their job. And clearly, uh, the prompt that Suzanne and her colleagues gave me elicited lots of writing, uh, lots of writing. And in fact, I may be referring to my script more than I usually do. It just kind of happened. What can I say? Uh, I expect if I hadn't done it, this is what would have emerged extemporaneously. So let's move on. I'm going to, um, I did that, I guess that didn't work. Pushing the wrong button. Which, the forward button? Oh, I had it upside down. It's, it doesn't matter how good you are with some technologies, when you get something different, the interface changes. Anyway. Um, I'm going to go in and out today of a little bit of personal history and anecdotes with writing majors and independent programs and then trying to talk about the connections that I think are crucial for writing programs and especially for writing majors as San Diego State is about to embark in an, what I think is going to be an exciting adventure of having its own major. So I'd like to begin with a little bit of history including my own personal history and Let's go back to the spring of 1993. The spring of 1993 happens to be significant in the history of independent writing programs. There are three programs up there, three universities. All three of them started independent writing programs in the spring of 1993. Now a little bit to my narrative. Uh, at that time, in that year, I was in my sixth and most difficult year as chair of the English department at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Hard for people to believe considering my personal history and professional history in the last 20 years, but I was actually chair of an English department. I'm not sure an English department would ever have me again and that's probably okay. Our problems were the usual ones that permeate departments 
of English, where rhetoric and writing and literature are housed together. And they've been going on for some time. However, for a variety of reasons I don't need to articulate. If you're interested, I've actually written about them elsewhere. Uh, we were reaching a flashpoint. So I needed to do something. That's what happens, Glenn knows, when you're chair, you're on point. Sue knows that also. Um, one of the things I'd fortunately learned in my years as first as a writing center director, a writing program administrator, and finally as a department chair, is I rarely had the answers. I was smart enough to understand that. Uh, so in order to be successful, I needed to connect with others who had differing perspectives and often more information so that I could build answers. Remember, this was 1993. In order to do that, I picked up the telephone, one of the more available technologies, and called some colleagues around the country who I thought might give me some ways to ameliorate my local situations. One of the people I happened to talk to, and I remember this because of what he said, was Rich Bullock of Wright State. Some of you may know Rich. Anyway, Rich doesn't realize it, but his answer actually changed my life and my career. Uh, Rich asked me if I used email, 1993, remember. Uh, I told him I had an email account since 1987, and I did. Uh, it's because I got along with the campus IT staff. And the problem is there were very few people I could eat, use it with. Nobody, you know. I, in fact, I remember giving a talk a couple years ago at a writing center conference uh, and mentioning about the early days. And I said, there was no one there. And Valerie Ballester from Texas A&M was there. And I said, I bet I could have emailed Valerie. And she looked up and said, yes, why didn't you? Uh, but that was about it. Uh, Rich then told me about WPAL, a professional listserv for people who run writing programs. I subscribed to WPAL uh, and posted the question. OK, a new life, a new way of communication was born. Now, the situation in Little Rock was such the provost intervened. And on July 1, 1993, the Department of Rhetoric and Writing was born. I served as interim chair for around six months and worked closely with the associate dean and the transition committee the dean created to split rhetoric and writing from English. And there are lots of stories, if anyone cares. Now, since I was actively engaged in creating a new department of rhetoric and writing, I began to rely heavily on my new source of information, the WPAL listserv, and through back-channel emails with other colleagues. It was there, and through those means, I learned that the University of Texas at Austin, in early spring 93, created the Division of Rhetoric and Writing Studies. And the fact that it was a division then is important, and I'll note that in a couple minutes, not a department at the time. And that San Diego State was very close to getting approval to create the Department of Rhetoric and Writing Studies, an action that happened later that year. Relying on those connections, those new electronic connections, and again, emphasizing this is all about connection. Uh, I kept in touch with my colleagues Shirley Rose and Shirley Little from San Diego State, uh, who were instrumental in forming the department here. And in fact, uh, we presented a roundtable at the 1994 Four Cs on independent writing programs, along with Becky Howard, who was then in the independent writing program at Colgate. It's kind of interesting how all of that happened 20 years ago. Uh, I also kept in touch with the faculty from the Division of Rhetoric and Writing Studies at Texas. Uh, now, as is very typical in higher education, all of these organizational changes and the new units that were created were a function of each institution's specific contexts. In many ways, we in Little Rock had a good situation. I didn't realize how good we had it at the time. Uh, we had a master's degree that was completely in writing. That came with us to the new unit. That was a no-brainer. English initially housed two undergraduate majors, a traditional literary major that stayed in English, and a major in professional and technical writing that was shared with journalism. That undergraduate major, at least what had previously been the English part, moved to rhetoric and writing. That means we started with two degrees. I mean, what an advantage that, like I said, I 
was naive enough I didn't realize how important that was. And while both San Diego State and Little Rock created departments of rhetoric and writing, Texas created a division. And the reason was contextual. Rhetoric and writing studies, when it was created at Texas, had no major. So it couldn't attain departmental status until it formed a major. And in fact, for around five years afterwards, every time I saw John Ruskowitz, who was one of the people who helped develop what's now the, the Department of Rhetoric and Writing Studies at Texas, I kept telling him, John, you need to be a department, not a division. It's important for institutional status. That means you need a major. And John was just happy to get out of English. He said, no, that'll come. Eventually it came. But again, the institution differed. But having the major in some ways makes you whole as an academic unit. And it, I, I'm thrilled that you folks are reaching that point. OK, uh, time to move on. Yeah. I've got it right. OK, now you have a major. And you've actually done the miraculous thing of surviving for 20 years, which is wonderful. Unfortunately, times are changing. And I'm not opposed to change. In fact, I've been arguing for change in the academy for many, many years. I'm just not sure the change we're seeing is all good. Not all change is good. So what I, I have thought about, because I, I've thought about this, I've talked about it, and I've written about it, is there are three kind of concepts that work together for helping academics programs to survive and probably to flourish. And those are relevance, flexibility, and connections. And when you think about it, all three are tied together. Today, eventually, I'm going to talk on connections. I really will get to connections. But I think we can easily see any academic program such as a writing major, will benefit from understanding how all three work together. No major can possibly succeed unless it's perceived as relevant by more than the faculty who designed and teach it. And I can't emphasize that enough. Faculty love what they do. They get caught up in what they do. And they design programs based on who they are and what they do. But clearly, students must understand the relevance. However, it's also important to having internal, such as administrators, and external, such as local businesses, constituencies, also understand the relevance of your major. That will become invaluable as you, because you are going to connect with them. Likewise, things change quickly today more quickly than we can imagine. Uh, the American higher education is used to moving very, very slowly. I keep on saying we are one of the la two of the last extant medieval institutions. And we move at the pace of the 14th and 15th century. It doesn't work anymore, folks. Uh, that means academic programs need to be able to adapt quickly to the needs of their constituencies. Having good connections with those constituencies gives those programs the information they may need in order to facilitate needed change. Having those connections matters because you don't know what to do unless you're connected. They then must be flexible on the constant stream of new information. OK. Why a writing major? Seems like a good question to ask, even though it may be, seem obvious to most of you. Of course, why don't we have a writing major, right? Uh, and one of the things you may have already noticed as I've been talking for a while is I'm not going to define the nature of the writing major. And Sue is probably breathing a sigh of relief because of that, because of her work on the committee that the Four C's Committee I'll refer to later. But rather, I'm rather going to focus on how a writing major needs to and does create necessary connections for the program that offers it. Now, I want to point out, I know I'm speaking directly 
to you in San Diego, where the Department of Rhetoric and Writing Studies is about to implement its new major. Most of my comments are going to be general. I'm going to talk about how writing programs have worked and how they might work. I want to really give you ideas rather than tell you what to do. I'd rather they emerge on your own. That's part of what we did in the workshop today. Uh, clearly, some of what I say will be very relevant locally. However, I'm trying to paint a much broader picture. Some of what I mentioned doesn't take place here and might not work well here. Caution, though it does work elsewhere. And understanding those differentiations may be helpful to you. To knowing why it won't work here doesn't mean you have to change, but it does say something about who you are and who the students you serve are. Uh, some of what I say may be things the faculty in rhetoric and writing studies might want to think about as they move forward once their new major is implemented. Given all of that, I'd like to start talking about service courses. And now you'll probably say, well, hold on a second. We're talking about majors. Why talking about service courses? And the reason is, for good or ill, it's almost impossible to talk about any kind of writing program without touching on service courses. They are simply part of the nature of who, what writing programs are, okay? I happen to think that's okay. Actually, I think it's a lot more than okay. For whatever it's worth, I'm one of the few academics who will publicly, this is public and I've done it in other venues as well, including in print, uh, who think service courses, uh, those units who offer them and the faculty who teach them should be celebrated, not scorned, okay? I've, I've said it. Uh, still, I know I'm in a decided minority. So what kind of service courses do writing programs usually offer? Obviously, first-year comp is one, and you folks have a first-year writing program here, okay? You're going to continue to have a first-year writing program. Almost every undergraduate at every institution of higher ed in the U.S. has to take first-year comp. Interestingly, first-year comp quite often isn't the only service course offered by writing programs. Often, especially when they are called technical writing or technical communication, they serve the engineering college um, to provide outcomes necessary for ABET accreditation. Likewise, programs that offer business writing classes often do so for the College of Business in order to assist with AASCB accreditation. And in fact, I understand you are about to undertake the business writing, which I think is a wonderful thing for a lot of reasons. And I that's great. It's also important to understand, while not driven by specific accreditation needs, more and more we are beginning to see writing programs develop and deliver courses in areas such as healthcare and human service, and to a lesser extent, areas like criminal justice and public administration. Uh, in fact, just to show you how relevant that is, I, actually wrote this around three days ago. And just last night, a colleague of mine um, in the Chicago area put up a Facebook plea because she's been assigned te to teach a course writing for law enforcement. Help, what am I going to do? I don't know anything about law enforcement. And it's amazing how many folks jumped in. And I've actually had experience working with law enforcement folks and uh, criminal justice people. It's amazing how you do that. But that's what writing programs are doing. Also interestingly, a former student of mine who was a deputy sheriff when he was a student is now enrolled in a master's program in writing. It's interesting how that happens. Uh, most of these non-accreditation driven courses emerge when disciplinary faculty understand that their students will need strong writing skills both to complete their academic work and even more importantly, once they embark on their professional careers. Yet, these are still service courses. And in the status-driven world of academics, and I can't emphasize enough, academics is a very status-driven world. We may not think of ourselves that way, but we sure are. Uh, service courses, even though when well done, provide good academic experience for students and help writing programs connect they're still seen by other faculty across the university as grunt work. Now, 
We may argue whether institutional status is important. Still, it remains a reality, and an important reality because unit status often drives resources such as departmental budgets and faculty lines. Uh, and I understand from my conversations here that the status of having an undergraduate degree is more likely to grant faculty lines here. So this is a big step for rhetoric and writing studies. Uh, it shouldn't make any difference. If you're teaching X number of students, you should need the requisite number of faculty, but somehow you are more equal if you have a major. So this is a, this is a good deal. Okay, now things get interesting. Uh, traditionally, academic units offer an undergraduate degree, historic in their history, and then down the road they develop graduate degrees. What's interesting about writing programs, we, we just don't fit any mold. Uh, writing programs tend to start by offering a master's degree. That is more the norm. In fact, that way rhetoric and writing studies here is really kind of normal when you look at writing programs across the country. I don't know if you thought about it that way or even want to think of yourself as being normal, uh, but you are. Uh, it's quite often bec writing programs, because of their connections with the community, see a demand for writing instruction to practicing professionals. Most typically, people who find themselves doing significant amounts of writing in the workplace or secondary teachers who find themselves primarily teaching writing, though they were trained to teach other things. Clearly, this is the population very much like what the mas your master's program sees. Now, interesting aside, when I was hired at Arizona State to create a tech comm program, I initially thought I was going to be designing a master's program because there was no program. There was no technical communication program in the state of Arizona. Uh, it's simply the normal way to begin programs like that. So I was a bit surprised when my new dean told me the plan was to develop a bachelor's program first and then think about a master's program down the road. That's a traditional academic model. Uh, my dean, who some of you may know was Dave Schwalm, uh, should have known better, but we still did the, master, the bachelor's program first. And obviously, the dean won. Deans usually win those discussions. Um, having an undergraduate degree matters. It creates a broader base. So many writing programs then, after having a successful master's program, find themselves backtracking to create an undergraduate major once they've created a successful master's program. Now, having a major does something else that's really important and it happens automatically. This is what's really nice about having a degree program. Once you start granting degrees, you create alumni. It's just how the world works, right? And undergraduate programs simply produce more degrees than graduate programs, so they create more alumni. And I can't emphasize how valuable alumni are to any academic program. To many of us in academics, simply, we simply take alumni for granted. We graduate them and they go and that's the way it is. Um, it's, of course, it's nice if we run into them in the future, however, Alumni can be a powerful force in advancing the mission of the department, especially if we stay connected to them. Down the road, they may, may be a source of development opportunities. However, immediately upon graduation, they may provide connections to local employers, and I'll talk more about that in a little while. Okay, so what's a writing major? Is that, that's right. It depends, right? Now, and Sue knows this very well, since its inception in 2005, I've been a member of the Force Ease Committee on the major, which Sue initially chaired. Uh, the committee has surveyed writing majors located in both independent writing departments as well as English departments. And one of the things we've discovered is there's no one kind of writing major. We've also decided that not having a uniform nationwide writing major is all right. Uh, like so much else, there are both internal and external reasons for having a major look a particular way. And that's something I want, I've talked to the faculty about and I want them to think about. Uh, in fact, when the committee has looked at a particular major because we're looking at it kind of a, 
from a professional organization perspective. We're more interested in whether it has what are called gateway and capstone courses, uh, rather than it has a specific course such as history of rhetoric or research methods. That's more internal and local. What's clear in looking at requirements for writing majors at many institutions is that if a pattern exists, it's in some ways that the majors really must reflect the institutional mission and its organization. It's got to be a good match. And again, you know the match better than anyone from the outside. More often than not, when writing majors are housed in English departments, they tend to be more blended or hybrids than pure writing majors. As a result, multiple literary study courses are often required. In a similar fashion, when schools incorporate creative writing in a writing major, and that happens some places, there's usually some kind of institutional history that led to the inclusion. Rely on your history. More important than the institution's mission, history, and organization are the faculty. Clearly, the design of a writing major must be a combination of faculty expertise and vision. However, I sincerely believe that initially a faculty must hold back on grand plans. Faculty are really good at dreaming. That's part of what we do very well. We like to think globally. Uh, in the beginning of a major implementation, the faculty want to call on as wide a group of undergraduates as possible in order to attract majors. It's no good having this wonderful major if you've got three students. Focusing too soon even on attractive and trendy specialties can severely limit attracting significant numbers of students to something new and therefore unknown. Uh, and what you call things are important. We see lots of new majors emerging with all kinds of trendy titles and nobody knows what they are. Uh, if students are attracted to them, they're attracted to them because it's kind of trendy. And then they graduate and they say, this is the kind of major I am. And people say, uh, and what do you do? Writing major is traditional enough that people understand that. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience at ASU. Uh, it was clear when I went to ASU most people expected my new technical communication program would teach students how to write software documentation. That was the vision ASU had about technical communication. Okay. Uh, at that time, the leaders of the greater Phoenix area were convinced that the Valley of the Sun, what we call Phoenix, was destined to become the Silicon Desert. That phrase was tossed around. They thought that because the Southeast Valley housed several chip manufacturers, that startup software houses would bloom from the desert, and that they'd need all kinds of folks to write documentation. Now, while I think the Phoenix metropolitan area hasn't come close to realizing its economic potential, I also think folks who feel it will rival Silicon Valley have merely been out in the Arizona sun too long. I knew that instantly. Recognizing that, I was able to successfully resist to put the push to limit my curriculum to one which would lead to careers in software documentation. I openly acknowledged what I crafted was a vanilla curriculum. Uh, it was academically rigorous, but it was general. Enough to allow students to move into many industries, and I do see the conception of the new writing major here tends to be general. But just because it starts general doesn't mean you shouldn't think about having specialized tracks down the road. And you'll know those specialized tracks based on your knowledge of local conditions. To give examples, I basically had several specialized tracks that I'm going to mention right now based on what I knew of the greater Phoenix area. Uh, I did see writing information writing for the information technology industry is a need. That goes without saying. IT is in, in the valley. However, I wouldn't want to limit it to just software. After all, Intel, it's one of our large employers, makes hardware after all. Where? They're, they have chip fabs in, in Phoenix. They don't do R&D, however. They do that in Silicon Valley. Okay? 
In Phoenix, so production manuals are more likely to produce locally than new product specs. Again, differentiating the kind of things I might think in developing curriculum. Uh, I'd also like to see a specialty in writing for the healthcare industry. I see that as spanning the gamut from electronic medical records, patient educational information, patient treatment plans, to medical insurance writing, and an awful lot more. If you have a large medical community, it's an area of growth and something to think about. Clearly, we do in Phoenix. Since the program is located in Arizona, I also saw a track in writing for sustainable energy industries. Okay? We do that in Arizona. As far as I know, only Iowa State, and you may wonder, Iowa State? is offering courses in that area, and the reason it's Iowa State is because corn to ethanol. Uh, finally, I wanted to see a track about inscripting workplace training sims, partly because there's, part, there's gaming, part of the video gaming industries in Phoenix, okay? And drawing on gaming technologies but translating to workplace training, all of that needs writing. It needs to be scripted. Someone has to do it. Again, meeting program needs with local industry. That was my original plan. It's been completely unrealized. <laughs> yeah, I still think it's a good plan. Uh, it's just the program never developed with, with the resources because of economic ups and downs. Uh, but it's st it was still there. And I think having it, even if it can be switched, I would also now add a track and maybe institute it even more quickly if I could, and that's in writing for content management systems. It's something people simply do. Now, all of those specialties only focus on industry. I've totally ignored the government and nonprofit sectors. Those are also possible tracks. And I know your master's program already works with nonprofits. And I know, for example, in Arizona, there are over 20,000 nonprofits, most of them located in the Phoenix area. Every nonprofit needs at least one writer. They can't survive without one. And the large nonprofits have staffs of writers to do different kinds of writing. So as you progress with your major and see the opportunity to create tracks for specialization, look at your local conditions. And we talked a little bit about that in the workshop. See if there are any particular industries that might be appropriate, and definitely look at other sectors. And this is an addition, I, and this is hard. Don't only look at the past and the present. As difficult as it may be, try to look at the future. As potent, look at the potential in emerging industries in your area. That's hard to do to look ahead of the curve. But your students are in school now. They're going to be entering the workforce later. And they're going to be looking at careers that emerge later and industries that emerge later. And look at the industries that are most likely to need writers in order to succeed. And I think you'd be surprised at how many industries, especially uh, in our new economy, those are. Okay, who's a writing major? So this is, in many ways, the most important part. It's the students. What do they look like demographically? We talked a little bit about this earlier today. And one thing to understand is the program will probably enroll a demographic that to some extent mirrors the demographic of the general population of the school. Though I do think we can make some general comments about who writing majors are. And what was interesting to me in talking to the faculty in the workshop today was that San Diego State has a gen generally a traditional demographic of 18 to 22 year olds. My experience with metropolitan universities and writing majors is that's not the traditional demographic for writing majors, especially in metropolitan universities. Uh, now, except for the group, and it can be a very large group who is interested in teaching for a career, writing majors tend to be older than the general population and also have some work experience or be transfer students. In fact, it's not unusual to find returning students delighted to find 
but the school actually offers a writing major because that wasn't possible when they were in school before or at a previous institution. Being in the workforce for some years, those students have come to understand the importance of good writing skills in being a productive worker and being a worker who is more likely to be promoted. And that's important to students who've been working for a while. Now, this anecdotally again, I've been working with writing majors for around 30 years now, maybe more. Uh, I have, in all that time, I've run across only one high school senior who said he was interested in majoring in technical writing. That's not a very good percentage, folks. And what's even worse is the only reason he knew that technical writing existed as a career was that his uncle had been one of our master students. Okay? That means if you're out there talking to the high school folks, you've got to find a different hook because they just don't get it. Now clearly students may be interested in creative writing. They get that. It's out there. Journalism, which is another program, they get that. But few traditional students have any ideas that there are many good careers where you can be a writer. I mean, and that's part of the education that writing programs need to do. Now, I'm not even going to begin to talk about rhetoric here because all of us understand that a deep understanding of rhetoric is necessary for any success as a writer. Yet the popular view of rhetoric is such that even if students have an affinity for it, they're most likely not to realize this fact. And I've made some, talked a little bit about my experience with rhetoric in my own undergraduate program now where we, every one of our courses is rhetorically based but we don't have a formal rhetoric class. We don't talk about it formally, but I've been teaching our capstone course for the past two or three years. And as we, rhetoric is one of our outcomes. We base our program outcomes on the WPA outcome statement. So we talk about rhetoric and they kind of joke about rhetoric, the R word, which dominates everything. Even though we, we don't mean it to, yes we do, uh, but it does. And they get it kind of because they've been, they've been paying attention. And they understand if the writing they're doing is really applied writing, they need to understand rhetoric, even if they don't get it hit over the head with rhetoric. So then where do writing majors come from? I've already suggested that many are returning to school after working and realizing they need a degree and a writing degree fits their needs and preferences. However, if they're in school, they may be, attra may be attracted from other majors and I'm not uh, advocating formal major poaching. I mean, nobody's gonna like you if they know you're going after their majors. Uh, but there are areas where students have interest in a particular content area but recognize their personal contribution may be in writing. And we've already talked in the workshop about your successful writing minor. Some of those may decide to flip-flop, to actually major in writing and minor in their original area. This is also one other area where having disciplinary service courses often becomes a wonderful place to recruit majors. Uh, it's really not all that uncommon for students taking an upper level disciplinary based writing course to realize, you know, maybe I need to major in writing and if it's a business writing course, minor in business. That may serve my needs better. And since the whole theme of this talk, I hope at least, is on connections, I'd also strongly suggest that any writing major create a strong social media presence, including private networks, and we've talked about this earlier, in order for students to learn about the major and then stay connected to it once they declare. Programs that house writing majors will also consciously need to think of where their students go after graduation, which brings us back to connections. So I've got a statement here I'm going to read a preface to, first of all. Uh, as I alluded to before, higher ed is changing. Some of the changes are good, some perhaps not so good. What's important for programs is survival. 
Having a major is one way to help a unit ensure survival, but it's not, no longer good enough. That's where the connections come in. Having connections doesn't mean just knowing the right people both within and outside of your institution, but rather being important to others. That means having real value that's important to others. It means that if what you do is reduced or goes away, others will also be significantly impacted. That's important to understand because I'm not a social Darwinist, but we live in a strange kind of world where I really think we need to think about surviving. And my view of the world is the easiest and best and most positive way to survive is being connected to providing value for others because they become our best advocates. Let's me move on. Now, since the main focus is really about the major and not the program, and I don't really need to talk and we want to talk, I want to talk about external connections. So this is really the final section. And I kind of want to focus on, on three external connections, internships, alumni, and um, external boards, all of which I think are important. Uh, historically, higher ed institutions, especially individual programs, haven't talked about what we now call external stakeholders. Uh, we now see all of those external stakeholders as potential revenue streams, how things have changed. So everyone's interested in external stakeholders. Uh, there's nothing wrong with an external stakeholder giving your program money unless, of course, there are problematic strings attached. And that can happen. You need to keep your eyes open. More important for the survival of your program than even the money is that those stakeholders become strong advocates for your program and can become incredibly helpful for your majors. Now, you may notice that even though this slide's about external connections, two of the three bullet points directly involve your students. Your students are the key to all of it. Interns. One of the more traditional and easiest ways for writing programs to gain external ties with the community are internships. Programs with established internships, and it seems you all folks already have established internships of some kind, should do what they can to maintain them and enhance them. If the internship coordinator does not make regular visits to the site, for example, that should change. Site visits not only give faculty coordinators a better understanding of the environment their students are experiencing, it also is a wonderful opportunity to strengthen connections between the program and both the individual site supervisor as well as a sponsoring organization. So you're visiting then not just to see what's going on, but to cement the connections between the organization and the program. Being more visible and strengthening the relationship can not only lead to more internships, but also to building valuable external allies. Now, there's also proverbial good news and bad news about if your program doesn't have regular established internships. And I'm not sure if your internships are regular and established or you simply kind of find them as they come. Uh, the good news is that with a new austere philosophy, businesses are looking to do things on the cheap. Uh, that doesn't necessarily sound good, but it can be because interns are considered cheap. Okay. The bad news is it's still difficult to find organizations that will take interns. Since more and more intern projects, like much work, are now project-based. Uh, here we go. When an organization does look for an intern, it is only to do one project. That means new internships are often one-time situations. Maintaining internships can be even more problematic when students have a desire to remain in the community as it appears they do here. Uh, since many writing students are non-traditional, they likely live here and so you may see even more of that. If an internship works well, the student finishes the internship with a full-time job offer. Well, that sounds like success, doesn't it? 
The problem, and I've seen this happen time and time again, the problem is when that happens, you lose the internship. So I, I, now I've seen this happen time and time again, even in our new austere times. Good student interns get job offers. Uh, it also then means the programs need to look for more internships. However, a student who finds full-time employment as the direct result of a successful internship becomes doubly valuable to the program. Over time, and a growing major is always about th long-term thinking, those former students then become more likely to encour encourage their employers to hire more interns because of their experience. And at both institutions, both in Little Rock and at ASU, where I've supervised interns, I've seen past interns advocate for new interns, creating a multi-generational intern culture. That's invaluable. Alumni. Keeping connected with alumni should just be a normal part of how institutions and programs within those institutions do business. And again, I've talked about this with the faculty earlier today. While there is a strong alumni culture at some schools, usually those schools with well-established traditions and who have admissions defined for 100 or more years, uh, many schools, both at institutional and well as program level, simply do a terrible job of keeping connected with and using their alumni. And every program that's like that should be embarrassed. You guys are too new to be embarrassed. You won't be, okay? Uh, so no matter what the institution might do, it's imperative for writing programs to keep track and keep in contact with alumni. As I've already mentioned, alumni can lead to internship possibilities. They can also provide real job leads to new graduates. Keeping in touch with local alumni can provide opportunities for the alumni to give presentations for students about some of the projects and workplace situations the students might face in the future. Those presentations might be classroom based or they can be held in the evening for the whole program, students and faculty. Keeping the ties, keeping people connected. In the past, just keeping track of alumni could be a huge problem. However, now Getting an email database is a good start. Emailing alumni every so often about what's going on helps keep them in touch. And I've talked about programmatic social media sites a bit earlier. Obviously having a program Facebook page seems to be a necessity. It, it just is, for good or ill, it just is. And I'd also strongly recommend Having a pro you spending a little money and having a program like Ning, and we talked in more detail about it in the workshop earlier, or, or some other private social network site. Having an active social network for the program connects alumni, current students, and faculty, and it helps building a community that is invaluable to the community. And finally, then, external boards. They're a good way to connect multiple external communities to the program. Now, there's no one good way at determining a factor in who should serve on a board. However, I think the broader base the board's membership is, and that your program is a broad-based program, the more influence it might have within the institution. It's easy to think about having a board comprised of several alums, including multiple constituencies within the major, such as maybe a a practicing teacher, a classroom teacher who's graduated, who brings in educational issues, and a practicing writer who may bring other kinds of workplace issues involved. That's a good start. However, since membership on almost any board tends to confer status on the members, I suggest programs aim high when you look at other members. Think about inviting executive level, in some instances, even a CEO of a local business that employs writers. Think about the executive director of a large local nonprofit, especially if you have internships at that nonprofit. Since the board is comprised of members external to the program, one or two external university personnel might also be possible. And if your program has a service course for engineering or business, and it is going to be having business, I seriously think about inviting the dean of business or one of the associate deans to serve on the board. Again, there's status in it, and it brings institutional clout. Once the program faculty starts thinking along these lines, the local possibilities begin to emerge. 
while it's nice to have a board, it's better to have a board that's active. The people who serve on your board will be busy, but they'll expect that since they've been invited to serve, they've been invited to serve because of their expertise. You need to use that expertise. Again, your local conditions might con dictate some obvious uses. However, if you're just beginning with an external board, you might start simply by presenting your curriculum and outcomes to them with rationale for both to get them to really understand who it is you are and what you do and what you are expecting to do with your students and what they are expecting to learn. Once the board is familiar with the program and its outcomes, it then makes sense for discussion on how the program is meeting external needs to the external and if you have an internal member external to your unit but internal to the university or what might be done to have the program better meet needs as good as you are it's always possible to be better and to get that outside information it may also make sense to have members of the external board be involved in some kind of culminating project evaluation many programs and i'm not sure how you're going to go with this require a senior capstone project or program portfolio Having members on the board or some of the members of the board serve on a committee reviewing these projects not only give the board members a sense of participation and gives their perspective on your students' work, it also creates a real external audience for your students. The reality is that any time you can make your students' good work public, you are doing your program and your students an incredible favor. So, as we've seen, there are many ways writing programs can actively work to be relevant to their students, to internal and external constituencies. To do so, they must be flexible, and most of all, they must have strong connections. And so, the beginning. Uh, I know most presentations don't end with the beginning, and I've probably rambled on too long. However, as the Department of Rhetoric and Writing Studies is looking forward to starting their new major, I can only see a start not an end. I can see the department connecting with many new students who will call the department their academic home. I can see the department connecting with new external partners who will help support their new major. And I can see the department, and this is, there's a reason for this, connecting with other writing programs across the country with their majors. Uh, in other words, I expect you all will have some major fun. Are there time for questions, or are we? Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that uh, academia is one of two institutions left over from medieval times. What's the other? The Catholic Church. I thought that was obvious. Not Catholic. Well. Yeah. about your um, uh, the beginnings of the, of the, of the split between you know, the Cayman Autonomous Program uh, because um, we've been looking at the history of some of those and, and it seems like some of the splits are very contentious and some, and some of the splits shape the future direction. Yeah, it was incredibly contentious. Uh, I've written about it. If you're interested, I can give you some sites later. Most of the people don't probably care. Uh, it was... I always thought it was about disciplinarity, and a lot of my colleagues thought it was about personality. And in retrospect, 20 years after the fact, we were probably both right. Um, there's real disciplinary differences. Rhetoric and writing folks simply do different work. Uh, I'm convinced disciplines are defined by their research methods. And our research methods are simply different than our literary counterparts. And that's fine. That's okay. Uh, we do things differently than people in biology. And they're both legitimate disciplines. Uh, when you put different disciplines together and try to have them evaluate one another, you end up with problems. And because of that disciplinary difference, I think that's where the personality issues emerge. Anytime you get humans together, there are personality conflicts. But when you have real core differences on who you are as a discipline, and that's what we do as academics, it's a, I mean, it's just a powder keg. I, I used to say there were only 
two departments, this was around the late 90s when I'd been starting to look at this thing, only two English departments that really worked in the country. I since learned the two that I thought were models had all kinds of internal problems. So I won't mention them. Uh, it's, they had a great public face. But the same kind of problems that came to a head in Little Rock that I assume came to a head here and have come to a head at multiple institutions uh, are there. It's just rhetoric and writing are housed in English by accident. It's historical accident. Uh, and like I said, the need for the histories are just, we need more of the histories. Yeah, Chris. Where do the main lines of support come from? The, the person who actually did it at my campus was the provost, who I think the reason we had an advantage is he was by discipline a political scientist and had led the push to separate public administration from political science. Because as mu though he was more of a true political scientist, he saw that his applied colleagues were being hamstrung within the traditional department. And when we presented an argument that similar to that, it was something he understood. I think there was true at Texas too. The provost was the yeah. leading hand in creating that division. Yeah, yeah. And it was different here because you had to go through system kind of faculty senate stuff. Well, the dean here was a political scientist who also had been involved in the split between and, uh, public administration yes. and political science, Yeah, like yeah. And there are other applied disciplines. One of the things I really pushed for in Little Rock, and I got an awful lot. I had problems, some problems with budget because the dean wanted to be too nice to English. Uh, but one of the things that I wanted was I wanted to move out of what was the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Science into what was then called the Professional College, which housed, aside from criminal justice and public administration, speech comm, journalism, and radio, TV, and film. And I kind of had that vision, that reuniting rhetoric fantasy that so many of us have. And I now see it as a fantasy, but 20 years ago, I bought into it. It would have it would have created an interesting, and considering how electronic communications have evolved, a really interesting dynamic core to have speech comm, what was then radio, TV, film, journalism, and rhetoric and writing together, especially with, because of my work, the rhetoric and writing folks moving into digital media. Uh, it didn't happen. The professional dean, who was a friend of mine, desperately wanted it for obvious reasons, and my dean could only see the loss of student credit hours in first year comp. And I understand his perspective. So it was one that didn't happen. Um, I, it would have been interesting. It would have been real interesting had that, had that movement from college to college happen. Other questions? Yeah. I like the sensibility that um, not to see the department as geared towards service, but that it should be connected to the real world. Well, I'm a believer in that. How, how then do we reach out to the community out there beyond the academic world? Well, there's all kinds of ways, and, and sometimes our students are our best connections. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I mentioned this in the workshop a little bit on how I, I'm shaped and my career has been shaped. Sue will relate to this because she's also a Wisconsin alum, though at a, a different degree. Uh, there's something called the Wisconsin idea, which is a function of the La Follette Progressive early 20th century area, which deals with the whole university mission of public service. Of, uh, and the whole service concept in faculty roles derives from public service, using our expertise to apply in the greater community. It's part of our history. And as a Wisconsin grad, it was one of those things that became part of my academic DNA, and I wasn't even aware of it. 
It was in fact maybe years afterwards when I was working and had moved completely to applied writing that I looked back and I thought, I I'm a function of the Wisconsin idea. That's what I'm doing. And I don't mind being considered a La Follette progressive also. But um, it's, uh, we need to think in those terms rather than being an isolated academic, which is what traditional humanities folks tend to do. I think we need to think externally. We have expertise. Our expertise is useful, and we need to make those connections. Initially, it may be best with, through our students, but as we gain those connections, sometimes it comes through consulting and training in the community.